Hello, I'm back and I'm waiting. <laughs> um, we're just going to wait for Child Body Safety to join us and others, and we're going to continue our discourse. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you for joining, Abimbola. Thank you, Faye. It's good to have you back. We're just going to wait for a few seconds. I'm sure um, well, G Child Body Safety will join us in a minute. It's been a good discourse. It's amazing how they could have learnt about that. And I'm just waiting for her to just tell us a bit more about that incident. And I would um, share a couple of child abuse um, cases that I've also um, dealt with that we can pick one or two things from. Oh. We're waiting. I hope she hasn't gone far. We haven't. I haven't seen her come back on. Oh, fantastic! Okay. Okay. So, have you? Yeah, fantastic. Let me let me add you on now. I'm waiting for you to join. Yes, I've. I uh, did her. I'm just waiting for it to kick in. Fantastic. It's good to have you back. <laughs> good. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah, you were saying. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about how it was detected. It wasn't like the child was closed. It was detected no. because there was CCTV in the in the apartment in the house. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that happened, and um, even at the time when they had the child, they saw what happened, because they, there wasn't CCTV in the guy's room, there was CCTV around the house, so they knew there were movements back and forth into the guy's room, and calculating the hours, calculating the minutes and time the child spent in the room is questionable, you know? So at the time the parents came out to talk about like what is going on, the child still didn't come up and say that it was real. You know, and that's where parents do get it wrong. You know, there's a lot of times where we kill our own child's self-esteem and they look for validation outside. Yes, and this yeah. validation this validation comes in different forms. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of abuse comes in. And that's why it's important we teach them, number one, self-healthy body images, body confidence. You know, it's very important because, and that's why what we do, we try to make them understand that it's not, I, for me personally, I have gone past teaching any child, don't say no. It's for me, I don't even think we should be even, we should be telling, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's for a particular age, you know? We, it's getting deeper than a child saying no to a perpetrator to, or yeah. to, 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 it's getting deeper. It's getting ingrained where the child wants validation somewhere else. Where, mm -hmm. you know, and another thing I want to talk about is a lot of, um, a lot of special need children too. Yeah. People yeah. are overlooked. But at they, high they, they risk. yes, and they are at high risk, and they are they're all over. You hardly see a case come out surrounding a lot of the special need children. But at the end of the day, whether the child is special need or without any needs, particularly, the, mm -hmm. every child needs the same thing. Every yeah. child needs self confidence. Every child needs self esteem. Every child needs, you know, something healthy about themselves. Every child needs you to hear, listen. Every child needs you to teach them something they don't know. Whatever you don't teach a child, you don't expect a child to know it. And mm -hmm. that's all. That's always my own philosophy. You must. If if I want to teach you how to make cereal very well, mm -hmm. and I see that you're not making the cereal very well, what I do to myself to calm myself down is. Did I even teach you how to make cereal, cereal in the first place? Did I teach you the right step or the right process? So for me, I've always gone around that part of what I don't teach a child. I, don't, I, I shouldn't even beat the child for it. 
So it has saved me a lot of learning processes, on learning a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Not all of us has um, parents that taught us what we knew now. But because yeah. we know that if we do it better, this generation might be better off. And that's why child body safety came into existence in the first place. So we teach them more from the normal body, the safety rules that, mm -hmm. oh, five um, safety um, confidence or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I, I would advise that a lot of parents to be on their children. Mm. I want to say something, um, and I want to talk a bit about risk factors because it's very important that you know we're, we're making um, um, some um, some assumptions as well um, that people people that are listening need to know need to know that there are certain types of children that are particularly at risk. And you said you know you you actually highlighted that children with disabilities are particularly at risk because obviously we can, we can ask why but it's obvious why they are probably not able to express themselves as 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 well as other children that probably for example if it's a if it's a if it's a challenge around the child's um um eyes if for example if the blind child how would they even know you know yeah. what who is who is around them and abusing them so there has to be a higher level of supervision for those kind of children a child that can't speak a child that is um you know has some kind of you know maybe autistic or has some kind of learning disability you know there has to be a higher level of dis um, supervision because those children cannot probably express themselves that this is what has happened another thing i i, I just want to talk about a few things about risk factors because it's important that parents know this now ch children of parents that are um, of from studies this is not labeling any parents but children from divorced families are at higher risk you know it doesn't mean every child that their parents are divorced are going to get sexually abused but it just means that children that are, their parents are divorced or separate are, are at higher risk. First of all, and why is that? What are the commonalities in all of that? Between separation, children that their parents are divorced. The reason is because many times there is less supervision because there is more pressure on one particular parent in doing most of the work. You know, I know of a, a situation of abuse where um, a mother used to go to, um, she would, you know, the father was not around. The father was living abroad and working abroad. They were not even divorced, but the father was just a, a, abroad. And the mother was the only one looking after three girls. And she was quite a stressed mother. That's another thing. That's another risk factor. I mean, she had a lot of risk factors. She was a yeah. more or less a single parent because her husband was not around. And then yeah. um, she, she also was very stressed. I think she actually developed depression. She was actually, she had mental health issues later. So parents that have mental health issues, drug issues, alcohol issues, anything that can impact upon a parent's capacity, even a parent that is a workaholic, their yeah. child is at risk. If you are a workaholic and the other parent is not present, that that is a high risk. Um, um, uh, uh, the children in that family is, you know, will be considered a high a high risk. So it's important that parents are aware of this because many parents are the ones that will hear this, and it's better for them to look at it and think, listen, okay, yes, I'm a single parent, but how can that risk for my child be, you know, reduced? Be ameliorated? How can I make sure that even though I'm a single parent, that those sort of things does not happen to my child. Because like I said, I'm aware or I was aware of a, of a story of a case where the mother would, you know, go to the shop in the morning, come back at night, leave the supervision of two young children. It looks like I'm losing you, um, child body safety. It looks like I'm losing you, but I'm sure you'll come back on. I think it's... This is three children. Oh, I, I lost you there. I'm going to try and get you back. Please just let me know when you're able to join back so I can add you back. I don't know how you got cut off there. I'm going to try and add you again once you're back. Okay, once you're back, let me know. But basically, this mother, what she used to do was she'd go to her shop in the morning, come back at night. It was difficult for these three young children. The eldest of the two of the three of them had to be the one to look after her younger siblings. 
at the age of about eight, nine, it was very, very hard. And from the neighbors, the neighbors began to notice that these children were home alone. Oh, good. I think you're, yeah, fantastic. Uh, let me add you on now. Waiting for you to join. Fantastic, fantastic. I don't know what happened. There's some issues with the internet. It happens. Anyway, yeah, so I was saying that, you know, some children are at particular risk. And, you know, professionals need to know that. They need to watch out for that. Teachers, head teachers, you know, pastors, um, 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 uh, child care workers, whoever it is that supports children. We need to be aware that some children are at more risk than others. Children whose parents are workaholic, children whose parents are not readily available, children whose parents are divorced. Because not only does it affect or, or separated, because not only does it reduce those that have an eye on the child who really care mm -hmm. about this child and be able uh, and and you know and is able to be there for the child it also puts more stress on the other the caring parents because now instead of two people doing this work we now have only one person doing it so it's important for us to recognize these risk factors for children because predators predators of child abuse child sexual abuse they watch out for these factors they're looking out for children that are particularly vulnerable, children whose parents are not readily available, children with low self-esteem, children who are not well cared for emotionally, children who have been, you know, have some sort of emotional deprivation in their lives. They watch out for those kind of children. And those are the children that are easy prey, you know, and it's, it's something that we need to watch out for children whose parents are arguing all the time when they're always, if there's constant friction in the home, constant maybe violence, domestic violence between parents, children, you know, where there's domestic violence, it's very likely that child's um, self-esteem will be low, very likely that that child can be, you know, looking for affirmation somewhere else. So important that we re recognize those risk factors. Like I said, while the community around the child can be a good support for the child, they can also be a risk factor for the child. Because a case that I came to, you know, um, read of recently that happened in uh, Nigeria, I mean, Lagos, the family, I mean, the mother was a single parent. She would go to work in the morning, come back at night. She felt, well, you live in a communal area. The child was just about nine years old, looking after two other siblings. So she would be at home all day, go to school, take her siblings to school, come back with her siblings from school, have to make sure her siblings have had something to eat. It was quite a lot of responsibilities for a young child. So she was vulnerable. I mean, the neighbors were aware. And before you knew it, a, a, a young chap who, who, who had his eyes, you know, roving, looking for whom to devour, saw that these young girls were always at home alone. Their mother would go out in the morning, come back at night, go out in the morning, come back at night, and she was not really in tune. And even when the abuse happened, the child said she never disclosed to the mother, never talked about it. Why? Because the mother did not have her time. So obviously, she could sense the dynamics going on in her family and was able to pick up that, listen, th th this man doesn't really have my time. She would probably not believe me or probably, even be, probably be scolded and beaten for what has happened. So... It's, it's something that um, we need to obviously keep talking about and seeing how we can support children that are, um, that are more vulnerable, um, even in our communities, to see how they can be better supported and to make parents um, more in tune with their children. I mean, there's nothing wrong in asking uh, friends that walk from dawn to dusk. So who is looking after your child? So who, you know, who do you leave your children with you know, when you're so busy? You know, because a lot of people in a place, you know, metropolis like Lagos are very busy on their jobs, very busy with their careers, very busy with their businesses. And they have children. So who is caring for those children? It's a good thing to bring up because it may not have even occurred to them at all to think about it. You know, who is looking after your children? Are you sure they're safe with them? Have you considered them? Have you talked to your children about this? Even if we're not the ones, we can always raise these um, conversations with um, people. Um, yeah, so please, um, I just wanted to find out, so what else do you think is important for members of the public to know when it comes to the issue of child abuse? Would, would I mean, uh, 
people you you've said um I, I i mean i'm happy that you mentioned most of the things that causes um um that make children be at risk you know mm. the grooming method of 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 perpetrators parents need to understand and that's why we talk about parent guardians and school owners teachers carers to know the fact because there is there is um there is a grooming method there's a grooming model for every perpetrator and they keep coming up with new models keep coming up with new things you know if a, if every parent take that time to know how each and every child is groomed because a child like we all know that nobody that the child I mean a stranger cannot walk into the house and just pounce on the child mm. Mm. if they understand how this grooming method works and that is why i like parents that go all out intentionally to read about this things to teach mm -hmm. their kids and parents that send them to some of our classes to learn because really these children we're not putting responsibility or protection on the children mm -hmm. we are just empowering them to know what to do when they're in situations they cannot control so they do you go around you go to schools or how do you you know what group of children Personal, do you support? Um, what what we do is and um we organize programs i i go to i i like going to school i'm not saying that going to school is not okay but i prefer working with children in an environment where they will listen if you call me as an educator to come to your school and talk to children on the assembly ground i'm not going to accept it because i'm not capturing any child at that particular time they are not settled you're telling me okay come at 8 o'clock or we come at 7:50 to talk to these children at the assembly ground i know how the mentality of children works their attention span it's they get into class but we know their attention span so if i'm getting into school i'm number one i'm not giving an ultimatum for what you need to do i'm telling you how this thing work with children so if you are calling me as an educator to come to your school to talk to your children then you need to work with me based on the way the children will accept what we are teaching so you cannot i would not attend the a, a teaching um, thing where you are telling me to talk on the assembly ground the children are standing they're not comfortable they're not set to so if i'm talking okay i'm just probably i i i don't go anywhere where i don't measure impact mm -hmm. i i'm i'm I, it's a waste of time and it's a waste of the children's time it's a waste of resources so what 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 we do is we come up with uh, programs when we go to schools we make sure that if at all we want to come to your school that outside the program where we organize specially so we go with um decorated placards that children can put on their walls there's no 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 where that 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 plaque will not fit into the room of the day. so the child wakes up after you even if they don't listen um 100% they're still going back to what you gave them to tell them what to do at a particular time when they're in trouble so on the other time what we do is we organize special programs that involve children and play because that's the only time children learn better when you put them in an enabling environment children learn better so we as an organization child body safety that's what we do basically we make sure that we organize a program that the environment is enabling for the child the environment is relaxed enough for the child to learn and to play so at that point in time we we don't do one day program because you will never know a child in one day because the first day they resume to our program we're just getting used to them so a lot of time we get a lot of revelation a lot of reveals about abuse from these children as well because you've warmed up to their heart you do you have relaxed their mind you've told them that it's okay to talk it's okay it's not about read. we let them read we let them play so they're very relaxed in an in the environment that we organize our programs mm -hmm. and what that's what i make sure that 
if you want to come on board my program as a volunteer, as a, a facilitator or something, you need to understand that play for us as an organization is important for those children, no matter their ages. And we make sure that we leave the memories in their, in their heart. So those are the things they keep coming back. To, oh, you, I've seen, I mean, I still got calls from some, some ch children yesterday. Oh, I just remember the picture of what you sent or the something. You know, this thing gives, these are memories that keep ringing in children's life. If you teach a child now, he might forget tomorrow. But if you leave something for them to hold on to what you're teaching them, they learn and hold on to. So for me and for us as an organization, we have used play and um, memories to, to work for our programs. So when we go to school, we know that most of what we do might not fit in into all school, but we tend to use something that will create memories, at least in their lives when we go to school. So, so those, those are the two things we do. And um, it, it's, really, it's really worked. It really worked for us. It's really worked for a lot of parents. I've met parents, met me, I mean, Afterwards, some years after meeting me and still thanking me that my daughter still sings this song, still does this. I mean, my son told somebody that you can't do this to me, you can't do that to me. And I mean, for me, it's, it's a joy for, for everybody that's come on board on these programs and for all the children. And it, it's, it's been an amazing journey for me and for all, my, all, my, all, all the people that have come, come on board with me. You know, because this thing, you can't just do it alone because we group them into ages. We group them. So the last one we did was um, we realized that we started from age five. Mm -hmm. And I realized that age two do learn body safety rules. So we, 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 we incorporated from age two to five. We incorporated okay. another age. So we call them crayon, crayon um, class. So in that crayon class, what we do is we make sure that everything that is about body safety, about consent, about um, stranger, danger, is all in an art form. So the children paint them. And before you paint them, you read them. So this, 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 these are things that we incorporate in, in, in our programs to teach about prevention education. So, and um, I, I mean... I, I don't want to I don't want to blow my trumpet, but I've seen a lot of children I mean call back to, to say thank you. And I've seen a lot of parents, you know, still willing to come back, still willing to bring more children to this program. So for me, I'm 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 just I'm I'm just happy God is using me to to yeah. to do that. It's a great it's a very good it's a great work. I mean without uh, I just want to ask, is there any way that you feel? I mean that's probably not your niche, but is there any way? Because I feel that there's so many children that are more vulnerable than this, you know, like we've talked about. Um than these children that is it, it, it one of the things that um pains me a lot in terms of child protection work that we do is almost like those that are that come for the training those that come for the work are those that are already almost already in tune already they already have an awareness exactly, of what exactly, the problem is exactly. so that, that that for me is a big issue because we, we, yeah. we do a lot of training on child protection on safeguarding yeah. children and even when i did that work here in the uk when I did that work in the UK, if you do it for um, community groups, all the people that will come, they're the clued up mothers, they're the clued yeah. up fathers. The people yeah. that need it will not exactly. turn up. I have an exactly. issue with that. So I'm beginning, so that's why I'm, you know, I'm just thinking we need, these people are the ones that need it. The ones that, you know, the children, the children that come, you know, the parents already have a high level of education. They have a yeah. high level of understanding. They have a high level of everything you're saying. It's, you know, just building on their body of knowledge. They already know to a large extent. Like, for example, the children that come to your program, the parents are already in tune. They already have a good idea that these things are important. These things are, you know, essential to, you know, my child's, uh, um, uh, development, they, they've engaged with the process, but I'm just concerned about children whose parents yes. are out there and yes. is like no clue. <laughs> <laughs> I have an issue. 
I have an issue there because for us, I mean, every child matters. So, you know, that's almost yeah. like an ethos for us. And we, we keep thinking, okay, so how can we reach the hard to reach children? How can we help the hard to reach children? How can we support okay, so them? I am, I am, I'm so happy that, you know, that's why I was laughing when you were talking about this. Because the last time I did a, a, a program uh, for child labor, and I was telling the interviewer that I am sad that the people listening to me are not the ones that have their children in the labor market. Mm. You know, so mm. I am, I am, when they kept asking me questions, I was, I was, I was not reluctant, but I'm like, who exactly am I talking to? I'm talking to the people that don't even have their children on the street. I'm talking to the people that don't even have their child exploited. So I, mm -hmm. I had to ask another question, just the way you're so passionate about it. I had to ask the interviewer, like, who exactly are we talking to? <laughs> because we are talking about child labor here. I'm talking to people, people that put their children out there for child labor. They are not on social media. They're they not. They're not. They're not. So, you know, <laughs> And I'm, and I'm so happy that you're so passionate about that aspect as well. The thing about it is the more advocacy group that comes up, mm. the more government can support. And what advocacy people, the group doesn't understand is when you go to the less privileged, because we have and ham that work on the less privileged communities mm. that impacts prevention and other things. You cannot go to the less privileged community without having something to give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't walk into you can't walk into an environment where people are in need and you're talking. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to learn their language. Oh, and yeah. their language their language is by giving. Yes, gifts, yeah. yeah. What what we do is when we are going to preach prevention education or we are going to preach other things for the less privileged for rural, deep, deep rural, when people see me and see my pictures on social media. And they see when we go to the field where you have to roll up your trousers or roll up your sleeves, it's a different ball game. But the way you will talk to a parent of a civilized community is different from the way you will talk to them. You can't just get there and just open your mouth and talk. Already, they're already looking at you that, what are you talking about? Is that what we want to hear? So mm -hmm. for us as a group, what we, what we came up with was to enter through menstrual hygiene kits. That is the gift we are giving. You have to have something to give to a less privileged community before mm -hmm. your impact. You can engage with them, yeah. Before you, you know? So if we are talking about these vulnerable children and needing them to learn about sexual abuse prevention or what to do, how to report, you get there. Stand in their midst. Listen to them. Take one child. What we do when we are organizing program, we go to the less community. We, there's a particular place called those being a village. Mm -hmm. It's it's crazy. So what we do is we seek for children that are willing to learn because there's there's different group of children in that community. Some are not willing. Some just want to go. But you, we have product for them. But the children that are willing to learn, we take them when we are not doing our advocacy um, work with them, we bring them into our programs. Because when they mix with these children, they understand that there's so much to life than just staying inside that community. So they aspire for something better. They don't want to be abused. They don't want any man to touch them because they've seen a child that, you know. So we try to mix those things together. So we have different things that we do for different community and that's what a lot of advocacy groups should come should learn that if you're going into a less privileged community go with something to listen and to give once you try to give them something they know you have number one not all of them but some of them will know you have a bit of their interest or heart. So why are you even gifting those things to some of those children? They are asking you questions. Auntie, ah, one bro saying, eh? I don't want to be like this, so I want I want my life to be better like your own. They're already, they're already connecting. You have to have something that will make you connect with them. There's a lot of, there's, you can go to a school to speak and the children are not connected to you because they're not seeing something they're connecting to. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You have to give them gifts. I remember, I mean, we do a lot of reaching out to the heart. It's, it's, it's not just gifts. It's not just gifts. There has to be a connection. Mm-hmm. And they, every child has a voice. Every mm-hmm. child has something they used to connect. Mm-hmm. Some of the students, some of them are gifts. Some of the students are just the fact that they just see something on you and they like and they like it. And they feel like, Auntie, how if it be like you? We work you have with that to... groups a lot. Um, one of the things that um, we haven't done a lot of, um, the, the child protection stuff is so, so, so important now, especially in the world is going on around. And with the amount of pe- perpetrators that are coming to justice, I think it's yeah. nothing. And the perpetrators themselves know that they can easily hide away like rats. So there has to be a lot of awareness you know, going on. And I like that strategy, the strategy of going into community groups and supporting from the grassroots. Because like I said, their parents probably won't bring them anywhere. The parents don't have their time enough to bring them anywhere. They won't take them anywhere. They won't take them. If you say you organize a program somewhere, let them bring your children. You probably won't sign up. So it's about, I th- yes, I think it's, there's a, like you said, a lot of advocacy needs to be done to those hard to reach groups. Whichever way, I remember when we do our, we do our gifts distribution, as simple as it is, you can see the excitement of the children, you can see them engaging with the process, you can see different children coming out to talk about different things, you know, what they like about this program, what they like about school, what they don't like about their neighborhood, just different, different things can give you an idea into what is going on in children's lives in different communities. Yeah. But there is yeah. still a lot, we're still, there's still a lot of work to be done, but without a doubt, everybody has nobody has unlimited resources everybody still has to work within the resources they have so um um it's it's a wonderful thing you're doing i'm i'm you know really impressed by it but for you know like i said one of the things that's always been a big issue that we are you know planning and strategizing and looking at how we're going to um I, I deal with this issue of um um informing children is how how do we reach the hard to reach children it's easier to reach children that are in you know within your sphere of influence children whose parents are clued up but reaching children whose parents don't give a hoot whose parents don't have time to deal with anything called child protection because they're still looking for food on the table how do we reach these children is is a big the strategies that we'll probably look at. Oh, she's logged out. Uh, da, 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 da. I think that was just um, something to do with the poor connection. I wait for her to come back on before we round up. But it's just important to bear those risk factors in mind. Um, for those of us that are, you know, listening, you know, the kind of children are most vulnerable. Children whose parents, you know, are probably way, way too busy. Children that come from high friction families where there's a lot of um, tension between the parents and a lot of, you know, uh, uh, domestic violence in the home. Children that, you know, the parents are divorced, uh, separated because the likelihood is the parents that is the remaining parents with the child has a lot of pressure, you know, would have so much pressure on them financially, emotionally, and that supervision for that child will be reduced. It's just important for us to bear these things in mind as parents so that if we are in a position where, you know, because some parents may be listening and be a single parent and say, oh, does that mean my child will be abused? No, it just means these are risk factors that you need to be aware of. So who else is going to be caring for, you know, your child, you know, when you're not available, when you're working, you know, long hours, is that person someone you can trust? Is that person someone the child trusts? And those are things you can pick up. And these are conversations that we can keep having with children. The truth is many children will not even show. There are some children that will show sexualized behavior of in abuse that have been abused and will show it in their behavior. And there are loads of children that will never, you know, it would not show in their behavior. It would not, you know, their parents would probably not be able to tell. Nothing would go wrong. They would not, you know, they, 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 they would probably push it to the back of their minds. They will still function well in school. And you won't be able to pick up that something has happened to this child. I'm still waiting for child body safety to join back. But I'll keep talking until she joins us back. I think there's something wrong with her connection. But there are many children in that position where, you know, they will just carry on with life. They will put it at the back of their minds and keep going on. So it's important that we have these conversations with our children, check out, you know, what's going on for them, 
be our brother's keeper. If you know of, you know, you know, families where they seem to be struggling, you know, and they seem to be so fixated on their own issues that you feel this child or these children can miss out on even, you know, or, or these children can be at risk or at higher risk because of what's going on in this family. We should be our brother's keeper. We should step in. We should, you know, bring it to the parents' awareness. You know, who are you leaving your children with? You know, this housekeeper, this houseboy, this whoever, this driver, are you sure your child is safe with this person? Because they may never have even thought about it. It may just never cross their mind. So it's something to bring to the table and also to check up on, you know, on children. How, how do you feel about being with so and so? How do you, you know, do, who do you prefer me to drop you off with? Why? Why, you know, would you like to be with this person when I'm away? Do you like staying with this person? What do you like about them? What you don't, you know, what don't you like about them? It's, it's good to initiate these conversations because children, another thing about children that you need to understand, even as a caring parent, is your children is also seeking to protect you. As much as you're trying to protect your child, don't forget that your child also psychologically may be seeking um, to protect you. I'm just going to add child body safety back on. I think she's coming back on now. Don't forget that your child may be thinking, I don't want to burden my parents with this. Even if something is happening to me, I don't want my children, I don't want my parents to, to be, oh, it's good to have you back on. <laughs> so, hello, good to have you back on. So I was just talking while you were away. I'm just talking about this. Um, re it's written the, um, the risk factors for children and just, you know, talking to parents generally. And I also just, I I'll just let you round up. I'm going to say something now and we're going to round up when you speak. Um, but I was just going to say that a lot of parents, even caring parents, should be aware that, you know, as much as you love your child and want to protect your child, your child intuitively as well may want to protect you, is watching out for you. And children sometimes think, I don't want to burden my mom with this information. I don't want to burden my dad with this information. And it's important that you let your children know early that they're not being a burden. And if anything, you know, puts them at risk, let them know their, their, their priority to you. It's important that you let your children know up front. Let, listen, don't let anything be too hard for you to tell me. Don't let there be any secrets between you and somebody that you don't tell me. You should never keep secrets from me. You should never keep secrets. You should let me know. There's nothing that is so difficult that I can't handle, that, I, you know, that we can't handle together. Because a lot of children, psychologically, you know, they think, oh, I don't want to make my, you know, my mom is doing a lot for me already. My mom is, you know, she's such a wonderful parent. She's such a wonderful single parent. She's doing all of this thing. I don't want to burden her with this incidents. I don't want to make her feel bad. I don't want to put more stress on her. So it's important for children to hear from us that no, you're not being a burden. You're not being, you're not stressing me out. Just tell anything going on for you. You are my priority. You know, let children, let your children know that they're your priority. Nobody else is as important to them, to you as they are. And, you know, yeah. as, and the more they hear that, the more they'll believe it, the more if anything happens, they'll be able to come freely, you know, um, to talk to you. So it's so, it's so nice um, having you, uh, Balaji, uh, mm -hmm. and, the, and the work you're doing is amazing. And it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm so glad that there's so many uh, uh, more um, non-governmental organizations doing a lot of work with children and helping to prevent and to support and to promote children's well-being. Please just let's have, you know, some of your closing remarks around all of this and what's, you know, some important points you like to bring to our attention again. Okay. Um, I, I would like to just leave this. that Before, people, I, I mean, before, people used to think child sexual abuse it's um, maybe when you're going through something. Child sexual abuse doesn't have boundaries. It doesn't know any social economic um, side. It doesn't pick side. And once you remember that as a parent that child sexual abuse, when it happens to a child, you cannot measure what happens to your child. You can only try. And parents should be able to understand 
different between normal sexual development and when there's a problem with your child. This normal sexual development, a lot of people, because there's a thin line to notice when a child is abused. A lot of parents should be able to dig deep. Like someone mentioned randomly, said, ah, what I do is, I I naked my child to see if there's anything that happens. Wow. If that works for you, if that works for you, so so be it. How will that no, work? That <laughs> <laughs> as a, as a, <laughs> when you leave your child with people, it's a, it was a random it was a random talk. But I sat back and I am the kind what of if person. What not penetrative sexual abuse? What if it's okay. you know? Well, you know why I said that? You know why I said that? I'm one person that I'm never judgmental about your parenting skills. If that is what works for you. So it is for education it. without a doubt. <laughs> I, would, I would judge you based that on... That is not judging. Is. This is... It's, a bit <laughs> inad it's not adequate. You, what, what you've got there in terms of knowledge is not enough. We need to give yes. you some more information yes. and knowledge. Yes. <laughs> you need to one thing about parents is some parents who a lot of parents don't want to hear that they're not doing a good job. No, no, and no, they're not doing enough. <laughs> they're not doing and so, they do so more. There's a difference, yes. You and stand with you, know, <laughs> you stand with you know, a lot parents is trying, without a doubt. Don't yeah. let's knock parents. A lot of parents are trying. I know parents yeah, in yeah, most yeah. parents, except apart from the abusive parents, no parent is looking for their children to be abused apart from the parents that actually abuse the children themselves so they're doing their best maybe looking for money for food for this but they're probably not in tune with everything and it's hard being a parent can be a killing task especially in a place like lagos so i mean yeah. it's the sandwich method of affirming parents and also highlighting that there's still a lot more that can be done and then obviously making it clear that you are doing a fantastic job you know, yeah. it's all, I just thought, in the case of the child, you probably just embarrass the child. Yeah, you know, because when, when, I, when I heard that, when I heard, when she said that, we were talking about some things and she, we were talking about how you can, okay, they were asking some questions that how do you know if a child is sexually abused? So she just busted it in like, ah, and you know that parenting has a big um, umbrella. We might say this is working and this is not working. I won't stand in the position to tell you if, unless I'm hardened to what you're doing, unless what you're doing is wrong. So when she mentioned that, I left it for her to just accept that at least you did something. Mm -hmm. But later, we will do more. But mm -hmm. when you, once you, as a parent, once you attack them, not attack, once you be, once it's looking like you are countering their parental skill. You have lost mm. them. Mm. So there's a lot of ways we bring parents in to mm -hmm. teach prevention. Mm -hmm. So we leave them and say that, what do you do? So we, there's a lot of things we hear, and that's just one of it. Wow. So once, you, once, a child, once a parent that is from one community, or one, the, the, and he's saying that, ah, I will just go ashore, you know, look at everything. I am, I am already giving you an accolade that you're doing something. I will knock you off. Mm. Because I'm throwing you in to teach you the next okay. level. I get the, I get the, 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 the scenario now. <laughs> it, 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 it's, about, it's about, you have to make people warm up to what you're preaching. Oh, if they don't like what you're preaching, they won't listen to you. <laughs> so it's important that we get that straight. Mm -hmm. Let's see. We appreciate all the things you're doing as a parent, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more to be done. Mm -hmm. It is preventing child sexual abuse. It's so on my on my on my journey and so far that I've seen, it's so preventable. You hear some stories and you will look at it like it could have been prevented. Things could have changed. This shouldn't have happened to this child. So for me, and that's why I am so much of a bit of an advocate for that prevention. Child sexual abuse is preventable. If we don't a lot of aspects of it, I would say from my role in uh, social work for many, many years uh, in, in, in the UK, 
A lot of it can be prevented, but it can't all be prevented. As long as we have perpetrators out there, especially parents who abuse, how does a two-year-old protect himself or herself? How does a three-year-old prevent yeah, himself or herself? The transgression um, 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 thing that we talk about when we talk to parents and when we talk about parent-child um, workshop, and there's a lot of transfer aggression as well. Yeah. There's, so, a lot, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of parents not knowing when to draw the line and parents not knowing when to draw their loss against their children. So it's still all about educating them. It's still all about punishing punishment at the right time. It's not about, like you, always, like you just said, how do we get these perpetrators to book? Yeah. Rather than expose children that are abused and showing them all over the news, it's yeah, that's better exactly to put the perpetrators all over the news than the child. Because you're harming the child more than the perpetrator himself. And like you said, and, like, and it's a big of a burden, and I can see that it's a big of a burden for you as well, that perpetrators are roaming about. And it, nothing is being done to them. I've seen a lot of cases that we went back to the police station and the perpetrator is not even in jail anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's a it's it's a lot of work that a lot of people should come in. If you if you say by tomorrow this night you're joining the bandwagon of preaching against child sexual abuse, do it right uh, and do the right. You know, it's a good so, bandwagon to join. <laughs> it's a good, yeah, you know, it's well, it's 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 a welcome. I mean, it's it's like hands all open to bring everybody on board because the more that it's i mean the more people you have talk about these things you know the more people hear about how to what to do how to report this thing teachers parents nannies drivers we we go as much as talking to drivers and um, 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 blue collar workers as well because everything that has to do with a child has to be talked on as we have to talk to them. We have to talk about it. We have to tell them what to do. Because already, we had a case that it was the nanny that was showing a pornography movie to the child, and the child was just four. Mm -hmm. So before you know it, like you said, those are non-contact uh, sexual abuse. And it's important as a parent, too, that when you're bringing somebody into your child's life, you need to learn that there's a body safety rule around your child. You are telling your nanny, take my son to the swimming pool. And you are telling the nanny that make sure he wears his flutes. Make sure he wears his goggles. Make sure he wears his um, ham flutes and some other things. But you're bringing the nanny in and you can't tell the nanny the safety around your own child. Like, we don't give them this at this particular time. We don't show you. You're not allowed to give my child a phone. You're not allowed. If she say no, that he doesn't want something, she does. Sometimes we, we, we tend to not draw the line of disrespect and when a child needs to be assertive. Yeah. You know? So those are the things the parent need to put in check. And I just want to say that if you can teach about water safety, all these safety, safety things, please put it under your rules in the house too, to teach them about their safety, about their own body, about people not touching them unnecessarily, about people not making them see um, illicit pictures. Because those ones too, this is, this is, I mean, this time that we have yeah. the lockdown, that is what is happening a lot. I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of links sent to children that is pornography. And I've, they sent it to me. And you as a parent will never, ever know that that's mm -hmm. what your child is watching. Contact. So that alone has built something in the child. So one way or the other, there's a hodge to have something. There's a hodge. So when he comes on that child, he, he feels like, let me just practice what I've seen. You know? So there's a lot of things, you know, parents should not fail to safeguard their children by all means. Yeah. Be on their case. Be on them. Ask them what they're watching. Ask them who their friends are online. Ask them what they're interested in. We are, a lot of time we always use our economic uh, problems to, to deal with our children. And at that point in time, a lot of children feel that 
they have to take up your emotional burden like you just said mm-hmm. you know so a lot of times without you telling the child what to do the child is already put in that box of let me take this emotional needs away from my parents mm-hmm. let me talk to somebody else about what is wrong with me and by talking to the person there might be an exchange of something that sex might actually end up being being the end result you know so a lot of times a lot of times we need to know that yes a lot of parents are stressed but our children are our legacy mm-hmm. they are the only thing no matter what you buy no matter what you do no matter how much money you have whether you is adopted child or is biologically born they are still going to be your legacy so what if you can put so much effort in your business why not put so much effort in your child or raising your child I really like so, that. I really really like that because that's a, yeah. If you can put so much effort in your business, you know, if you want your business to succeed, what about your children? You know, your children are really I think, you know, it's something it's it's really a point that um, a lot of parents need to um you know, take on board. I'm sure we're going to um the rounding up soon but i just want to emphasize this um uh, which i said at the very beginning and i want some parents to recognize this as well um uh, in my role as a social worker uh, when i was in the uh, uk i i i i've seen all, i've seen all the forms of abuse let's put it you know all the forms of sexual abuse that you can think of i've seen abuse on on toddlers I've seen abuse happen in nurseries. I've seen abuse happen at child minders. I've seen abuse happen in families. 50% of the girls that will be sexually abused will be sexually abused in their family. That's actually a dangerous um, amount of, um, um, of, it's a very high number. Um, I've seen abuse happen um, with, with caregivers, you know, from, you know, imam to pastor to teachers, it happens um i've seen abuse happen you know with strangers not as not as common if the child lives within a home but it happens you know neighbors um where they notice that the children are not you know at uh, well looked after i've seen abuse happen from you know within within children of uh, within children within children I've seen 14, 15 year olds abusing 10, 12 year olds, children of similar ages being abused. Where parents don't know. I've seen abuse between cousins. You know, they go for holiday somewhere, and you know, especially in these times where there's long stretches of periods. I'm saying it because I want parents to be in tune, and I want the public to be aware that. Um, the risk is high in many places and we need to uh, be very aware i know of a situation where cousins uh, got pregnant for one another um young young cousins I, I, i was aware of one recently somebody sent it to me on whatsapp i, I didn't know i don't know anything about the family but a family a, a son happened to have um, made two of his sisters pregnant wow so with head of some horrendous stories that is not even should never be heard of like they say but it happens it happens and parents need to be in tune you know the culture within your homes it needs to be very very clear you need to be very clear even with siblings you know what what is acceptable what is not acceptable i used to tell my children the stories i heard the things the things i was aware of so that they would know that there's nothing new under the sun i used to tell them many cases that i had to deal with of course i used to anonymize the, the 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 people but i used to let them know that look there's nothing that we haven't heard of and you need to be aware and you need to be clued up children in boarding schools it happens all the time you know and we you know that that's something that parents also need to it's not just happening with the drivers or with the caretakers or whatever where you feel your child is safest the most it could be happening there and parents need to also be aware of that um so um it's been a wonderful discourse um we we need to continue talking we need to continue <laughs> raising awareness we need to continue reaching out to the parents to the children 
and you know doing what we know best to do and looking for new and better ways of even doing what we do already thinking up new strategies and you know obviously looking for more resources to do the work because <laughs> i don't know about you but hey it's a resource <laughs> issue <laughs> at the end of the day it takes money to do anything yeah. you know, we need the yeah. funds we need the funding so we obviously need more funding and we obviously need more hands on deck volunteers to support the work but i can only just commend you uh, for your wonderful work for all the things you're doing i've seen it and i'm you know very impressed and i know that you know you're touching lives you're making a difference you're making an impact and what more can we ask of anyone um so thank you so much for all you've done thank you for all you're doing And uh, yeah. Thank you for coming on board today. Thank you for coming you. to share with us and for having this discourse. So have a great um, evening. I think it's I a good so, place. I'm so thank you. I'm, I'm so thankful for everyone that joined as well. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. We should thank everyone that joined. Sorry. My, forgive my manners. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for staying on. Thank you for joining. I can actually see my yeah. husband. You know, thank you for oh, joining. Really? <laughs> oh, oh my god it's good to have everybody thank on board you. thank you for being here thank you for listening thank you for having me we will talk behind the scene yes <laughs> <we will. laughs> have thank a good you. evening god bless you, you. thank you everyone thank you bye